first time or it's one of your f first few times um, at EFCA East Linfield. It's really great to have you here. Um, yeah, and hope that I can personally meet you after the service um, or, yeah, in the next few weeks. Um, but, yeah, thank you for joining us. Um, yeah, and also welcome to all the regulars. Good to have you here as well. Um, so, yeah, if you've been with us for the past couple of weeks, uh, you would know that we last week we finished our Isaiah series um, and we finished off with uh, hearing about the promise of restoration for God's people um, and God's promise of a new creation, a new heaven and a new earth um, where his people can yeah, dwell with him closely and that they will be rejoicing forever with no weeping and no crying. Um, but yeah, while we wait for, um, to enjoy these promises in its fullness, uh, we get to have little glimpses of God's grace and God, God's glory um, today. Um, and especially when we gather together, it's a glimpse of uh, what it will be like in the new creation when all of God's people will be gathered um, around Jesus, worshipping him together. So it's such a privilege to gather together, um, and it's such a joy to be uh, together to worship him. Um, so how about I give thanks to God for, that, for those things, um, and also ask God to bless our morning together. Please pray with me. Uh, dear Heavenly Father, Lord, thank you that you have shown us your grace and your glory in Jesus. Lord, thank you for sharing your promises with us, even though uh, we do not deserve it, um, and that you have shown us great mercy and kindness uh, in sending your Son for us. Lord, thank you for the privilege it is that we can gather together as your people. Thank you for uh, these little glimpses of your glory. Um, thank you for blessing us with each other um, with a place to meet and also the freedom of worshipping you um, freely in public and the gift of your word that we can hold it in our hands. Lord, we ask that you would um, help us this morning to be present, uh, help us to cast away any uh, worries or anxieties that um, are on our hearts and our minds this morning, help us to cast them away um, and cast them on you. Uh, give us clarity and presence to um, yeah, be focused on uh, hearing your word this morning and to worshipping you uh, together as a family. Uh, we ask that you uh, might bless this morning's service. May our worship be pleasing to you and may we uh, be mutually encouraged uh, by your word and by each other. And we ask all this in your son's name. Amen. So this morning, um, we also have a special guest with us. We have uh, Mike, Joyce, and their kids. Um, it's really a great pleasure to have them back here. Um, and yeah, if you don't know them, uh, you might recognize their faces, so, but we'll be hearing from Mike um, a little bit later as well. Um, we also have Holy Communion today. So um, yeah, it's a pleasure to be uh, remembering Jesus' death um, for us uh, together. And yeah, because of all the, all the things that are happening in service today, we won't have Q&A. Um, but yeah, I'll, I'll, as usual, encourage everyone to keep thinking about um, yeah, what we hear this morning and to keep asking questions of each other and challenging one another. Um, but yeah, how about we kick it off? I'll welcome the band to lead us in worship. Good morning, church. Um, one of the things that we do when we gather as God's people is to sing, to sing praises to our great God um, and to remind each other of the truth um, of who God is and who we are as his people. Um, we might be here today feeling weary, tired, burdened, um, struggling with um, yeah, our work or studies or struggling with our sins, but we have a risen saviour who has uh, defeated the grave and he is uh, alive now and he lives for us, with us. Um, so let's stand and remind each other of this great truth and hope. Now a hope that lasts beyond 
God's grace and he helps us as we struggle with sin, um, with the things on our hearts. So let us sing um, and encourage each other to hold on to God as he holds on to us.
Good morning, church. It's Pastor John here. Oh, that's great. I'm up here to do the kids' talk. So glad that uh, the boys and girls are down here at the front. If there's any other boys and girls, if they'd like to come down the front as well. Now, boys and girls, it's coming up to summertime and the weather is going to be hot. Now, we enjoy the beach and things like that. But what's the danger in parts of Australia, particularly forests, when the weather gets very hot? Yeah, fires, bushfires, yes, yes. So there's, um, that's something that uh, people have to look out for. Now, how might a bushfire start? So there's lots of dry fuel. Very easy, isn't it? Now, when the danger is very high, the government says they do a ban on fires so you can't have barbecues outside because even something small like a match and there's lots of fuel, dry twigs and leaves and everything, and it can easily go on fire. That um, That could be very dangerous, can't it? Now, we're going to be looking at the Bible today, and Uncle Michael is going to be taking us through James chapter 3, and as we understand how dangerous it is with bushfires, so James warns us that our tongues, our words, can be as dangerous like that. So Corin's got the Bible passage, I'm going to read it out for us. James 3, 5 and 6. Likewise, the tongue is a small part of the body, but it it makes great boasts. Consider what a great forest is set on fire by a small spark. The tongue also is a fire, a world of evil among the parts of the body. It corrupts the whole body, sets the whole course of one's life on fire, and is itself set on fire by hell. So match, small spark, can lead to a big fire. So it's saying the tongue is very small, but saying bad words, nasty words, can actually cause a big fire, big damage. James is warning us that we have to be very careful with how we think, and even evil can use words to hurt, to destroy, to uh, tear down. So very important for us to remember what we say matters, God wants us to speak in a way that honours him. And then uh, James goes on. We, We couldn't fit all of the passage on. The wisdom from above actually helps us how to use our words wisely. Uh, Trusting Jesus, following his way, is how we will actually use words to uh, help people to build up rather than burn, destroy and do damage. Yeah, so that's very important as we remember uh, what we say matters and to know that the wrong words can actually do lots of damage. Very important for us to remember. I'm going to pray and then it will be time for you to go to Kids Church. Let's pray. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you that you tell us uh, very important things. And we know that our words can actually be for good, but also for evil. Please help us to remember that as a small spark can cause a big bushfire, so it is that the wrong words can do big damage and destroy and uh, tear down. We thank you that your word is the one that gives life. And uh, we pray that we would trust in Jesus, we would follow him, And we would use our ways, our words in ways that please you, uh, that actually do good, that give life rather than do harm and destroy. And this we pray in the name of Jesus. Amen. Right. Thanks, boys and girls. It's time for you to go down to Kids Church. And anybody who's in the foyer or the side hall who wants to come into the chapel can uh, come and do that. There's lots of space now. Thanks, John. Um, Yeah, now is the time uh, for a few announcements. Um, Can I invite Carissa and then Marlon up, please? Um, 
this is an announcement about the women's um, sharing morning. So it was announced as Sunday the 17th, but now it's on Saturday the 9th of December. Um, it'll be in the side hall from 11 to 2. It'll be an opportunity for um, our ladies to gather together to reflect on the year and to share with one another and pray for each other. So um, Agatha sent out an email and that has details to respond. So, yeah, we'd love to see you there. And, yeah, please reply so we can plan. Thank you. Thanks, Carissa. Yes, so the men's ministry event is on next week. Uh, thank you for all those who have RSVP'd. Uh, if you haven't, I do encourage you to still do that. And if you have an RSVP, come anyway. Like, I do encourage you to do that. Um, I just wanted to read a passage just from Psalm 69. Save me, O God, for the waters have come up to my neck. I sink in the miry depths where there is no foothold. I have come into the deep waters. The floods engulf me. I am worn out, calling for help. My throat is parched. My eyes fell looking for my God. I was just reading this passage. So the topic for the men's ministry event is on world weariness. And this imagery is just really powerful because I think it encapsulates some of the feelings that sometimes as men we go through when we feel like we are up to our necks in water. It feels like we are drowning. So we are going to explore this topic. And as we've got Dan Shi, uh, who's going to be the speaker next week. Um, and there will also be a time of praying together and sharing as well. So. Please do come to the event. If you have an RSVP, please do that. Great. Thank you. Two very great events for literally everyone in the church, both men and women. Um, and I have a couple of announcements to share as well. So um, as you may have seen and read, there was a family letter that went out a few weeks ago um, about the potential uh, property at Five on. 518 at Lane Cove. Um, so there was a physical letter and I believe that the uh, electronic letter was sent out. Um, so following that letter, that is a really good update of what is actually happening, where we are at with considering this property. Um, we every, every congregation is having what we call family meetings and that is just a term that we use um, to uh, describe our family here <laughs> meeting. Um, so basically it's just like an open forum for um, everyone at English, so we're having our own English family meeting, um, to talk about this 518 property. Um, it will be opportunities for you to ask questions um, and hopefully it will be yeah, just an open forum for anyone to ask questions and having those questions answered um, by our English uh, deacons. So that would be a good opportunity um, to come along. And if you've read the letter to, um, yeah, please consider any, any questions you might have. Um, and then it will be a good place to discuss. So the first family meeting is on the 3rd of December. Um, on, so it will be after church at 1.30 p.m. So that's the 3rd of December, 1.30 p.m. So we won't have church lunch that day. So there is enough time to uh, decide what you want to eat for like half an hour and then go and get it and come back. Um, and you can obviously eat during the meeting, I'm sure. So, um, yeah, really encourage everyone to uh, please consider coming along because, um, yeah, it's really good to – it's important to be informed um, about what's happening and um, also, yeah, for you to – um, have any concerns or questions answered. Um, yeah. Also, the, uh, the other announcement um, that I was going to share is, yeah, Lennox had sent out an email very recently about um, expressing interest of serving. So, yeah, there's a lot of people, it takes a lot of people to actually get um, service every week to run. Um, a lot of yeah, people who do things behind the scenes and up front. So if you would like to um, express interest in being trained up to serve, um, whether it's um, welcoming, AV, Bible reading, prayer, service leading, anything like that, um, you can express your interest. It's, it's not locking in anything, but um, yeah, it'll just be good to get indications of who can help out at, uh, for next year. 
Cool. That's all the announcements I have. Um, so yeah, it'll be time now to get to know Mike a little bit more. So I'll invite Mike up. So you are a familiar face, but for Am those I? who um, <laughs> Hi, don't Ryan. know you, do you want to introduce um, yeah, who you are, your yep. family, what you do? Yep. Hi, everyone. It's great to be here. Uh, my name's Mike. i uh, married to Joyce. We have two kids. Olive is 11 and Jonathan is 7. Uh, we served in Asia for 10 years and due to COVID, we had to suddenly come back. We were stuck here for a bit and in that time, we decided to stay here permanently so I've been serving in a mission organization doing something like human resources, but for missionaries. Yeah, so not secular, corporate human resources like finances and things. It's more like missionaries, how they're going, uh, and comings and goings and things like that. Yeah, so, uh, yeah. And Joyce is serving at the kids' school, um, um, International Chinese School in St. Leonard's. Mm. Cool, thank you. Yep. Um, so, yeah, obviously you were our guest speaker at our English retreat mm. back in August. Mm. Um, but, yeah, do you want to share maybe an update on how you and the family are going? Yep. Um, yeah, and how we can be supporting, continue to support and pray for you guys. Yep, thanks. Yeah, um, I can't believe, yeah, we, it was so exciting to go to the English camp and we really loved it. Um, and I, the other day I remember talking to Joyce and we were just talking about we're feeling more settled. We've been back for three years, and you think, three years, that's so long. But we were in Asia for 10 years. Our whole life, our friendships, everything was there, and every year has been a slowly, slowly, you know, tweaking here and there, and this year feeling more and more settled. Not 100% there yet, but feeling, yeah, almost there. So really thank God for that. So and prayer points? Did you say prayer points? Or that's next? Yeah. yeah. Well, well um, yeah, how can we be praying for you and the yep. family as well? Yeah, I think thanks for that settling in. So it, 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 it's a bit stressful and tiring and settling in. So thanks for that. Um, the other thing is we're visiting Asia at the end of this year, and we're so excited because we haven't been there for so long. So it's sort of like suddenly left and then time to go back and just closure, if that makes sense, and visit. So we're really looking forward to seeing where we live for 10 years. Um, the other prayer points are, um, yeah, Joyce and I are just keen to read the Bible with this couple. So Joyce has already agreed with another lady to meet, but pray for momentum, because they met once and then it stopped. So you can pray for that. And the second thing is, I've asked the guy, but he hasn't said yes yet. So if you can pray that he'll say yes. So, yeah, if you could pray those things, it would be great. Awesome. Great. Yeah. And we'll, yeah, hear from you later um, as you give the talk. But, great. yeah, I'll, um, we'll lead on to a time of prayer and um, we'll be, yeah, praying for what Mike has shared, uh, but also uh, praying for the world, what's happening um, a bit for our church, um, the 518 property and, um, yeah, with Christmas leading up for all of us, um, yeah, and for today as well. So, yeah, please join with me in prayer. Our dear Heavenly Father, thank you for your grace uh, to us um, and through how faithful you are that you gave us uh, the gift of your son, Jesus, um, that you have saved us from our deserved punishment and wrath uh, because of our sinfulness. Lord, thank you for proving your faithfulness to us through all of history um, of the world and that we can read um, about your faithfulness in your word. Thank you for being, being our creator God, um, a God that made us and holds us in your hands um, and a God that doesn't change, um, who doesn't um, change their mind or um, is inconsistent. Lord, thank you for being um, yeah, that we can trust in your promises, um, that we can trust that you will do uh, what, you, what you say you will do. Um, and as we look forward to uh, the f fulfillment of um, all your promises, uh, as we look forward to the new creation and being able to live um, and dwell uh, with you um, and worshipping you, uh, we look forward to um, yeah, a world that there won't be any more destruction, war, um, crying or weeping. 
Lord, we pray that you would help us to uh, have faith as we wait. Um, Thank you for giving us the hope of Jesus um, and that we can look forward to this time. Um, But as we live um, in this period where we do still see uh, the world um, yeah, in conflict and we do still see wickedness and evil, uh, we pray that you would um, strengthen us, that we would uh, look to you um, and depend on your work in this world, knowing that you are above all, you are above every ruler, every government, um, every person. Um, You are the God over, yeah, everything that happens and you know, um, yeah, everything and you have a really good plan for all of us. But we pray, Lord, for um, the conflict, especially in uh, Israel and Gaza. We pray that, um, yeah, your hand will be over the situation. Uh, May you... um, Yeah, give comfort to people who have been affected. Um, Give aid and important, um, yeah, physical help uh, to those who are suffering and to those who have lost. Uh, We pray that you would give comfort and peace to uh, that area and to the people there. Lord, give governments and the people in power compassion and empathy. Um, Give them love and, yeah, give them the truth of who you are and what you have already done for us. In your, in your son. Um, yeah, we pray especially for Christians um, all over the world that, yeah, your people may be a light to all those who are still living in darkness. Um, may you work through each of them to, yeah, show others um, your glory in Jesus, um, that, yeah, many people may be saved um, through hearing, yeah, your, uh, your word and knowing the truth about who Jesus is. Uh, Lord, we pray for us. We pray for our church. Um, Yeah, Lord, as uh, Christmas is leading up, we pray that um, you would help each of us to, uh, yeah, have, uh, give us um, a heart to celebrate, um, celebrate the gift um, of your son that we remember each year. Um, And also, yeah, that you may be placing people in our hearts um, to, uh, share the gospel with, especially yeah, in this period of um, celebration and um, yeah, an excuse to I guess share the reason um, of the season. Uh, Lord, we yeah pray that you'll be preparing um, these people's hearts to hear your good news um, and give us boldness and give us words to do that. Lord, we also thank you for uh, sustaining the Year 12s in our church uh, through the HSC. Lord, thank you for um, bringing them through schooling and, um, yeah, that they can now, I guess, enjoy uh, rest and holidays. But we pray, Lord, that, yeah, that you would uh, be helping them to navigate this period of um, change, of finishing school and looking forward to what's coming up next. But we pray that you would be working their hearts, um, that, uh, yeah, you would help them to uh, discern, yeah, their priorities in life and that, um, yeah, you might be challenging them to um, continue to take you seriously and uh, your word seriously. And we pray that, yeah, as a church, we can be supporting them in this transitionary period as well. Um, Yeah, and that we can encourage them uh, in their faith. Uh, in you. And Lord, we, yeah, pray for guidance and strength um, as we, yeah, consider the future of, I guess, our church and the property. Um, We pray that you give us unity as a church, um, yeah, and also um, openness to each other and different opinions, but also, yeah, wisdom and guidance in how we um, think about um, the future of the 518 property, um, give us guidance in, yeah, trusting in you, how we do that and how we, um, yeah, can, I guess, open uh, our hearts and our minds to follow your plan. And we pray that, uh, yeah, you would be blessing uh, all the family meetings that will be happening, um, yeah, that will be fruitful discussions and, um, yeah, a good time to pray with each other um, and, yeah, to invite you to be working in our church. Um, Lord, we thank you for, um, yeah, Mike and Joyce um, 
and their family. Thank you for bringing them um, here this Sunday and, yeah, that we can continue to be supporting them um, even, yeah, in Australia. And we thank you for, um, yeah, your blessings on them that over the past three years you have helped them to finally settle into life in Australia. Um, Lord, we thank you for um, the ministries that they are both involved in, um, yeah, and that you have continued to use them uh, in Sydney uh, to do to further your kingdom and to do your work here. Lord, we uh, pray as they um, yeah visit visit um, Asia again at the end of the year. We pray that it would be a really big blessing and a good time for them to reconnect with um, old friends, um, to see yeah where they were living for so many years, and we pray that. Um, yeah, you would be just blessing that time that they can meet up with everyone that they uh, would like to chat to and to uh, reconnect with. And we pray that you would uh, be using this time for them to um, also yeah, deepen their relationships with the people there and um, also that you'll be blessing them with closure as well. And yeah, we also pray for the couple uh, that Mike mentioned. We pray that you'll be working in their hearts, um, that they would be open to reading your word uh, with Mike and Joyce. We pray for momentum that, um, yeah, the uh, lady that she would, um, yeah, be curious and to want to continue reading the Bible. Um, we pray that you'll be, um, yeah, working in her heart um, so that she might understand uh, who Jesus is um, and to, yeah, trust in you. Um, and we also pray for, um, yeah, the man as well that he would, yeah, be very open to reading your word. Um, yeah, we pray that you will be using Mike and Joyce um, as, yeah, lights in this couple's life um, and that, yeah, in your uh, grace and your mercy that you would be inviting them into your kingdom as well. Um, Lord, we, yeah, finally pray for Mike as he speaks to us this morning. We pray that you'll give him words to speak and, um, yeah, that you will be speaking to us through your words um, this morning. And we pray all this in your son's name. Amen. Okay, um, I'll invite Ben up to yeah give the Bible reading. Hey guys, if you haven't met me before, my name is Ben. Uh, it does say James 3, 1 to 12, but we're actually reading up to 18. In your red cover Bibles, that is page 846. So... I'll give you some time to flip there. Cool. James 3, um, 1 to 18. So, not many of you should become teachers, my fellow believers, because you know that we who teach will be judged more strictly. We all stumble in many ways. Anyone who is never at fault in what they say is perfect, able to keep their whole body in check. When we put bits into the mouths of horses to make them obey us, we can turn the whole animal. Or take ships as an example. Although they are so large and are driven by strong winds, they are steered by a very small rudder wherever the pilot wants to go. Likewise, the tongue is a small part of the body, but it makes great boasts. Consider what a great forest is set on fire by a small spark. The tongue also is a fire, a world of evil among the parts of the body. It corrupts the whole body, sets the whole course of one's life on fire, and is itself set on fire by hell. All kinds of animals, birds, reptiles, and sea creatures are being tamed and have been tamed by mankind. But no human being can tame the tongue. It is a restless evil, full of deadly poison. With the tongue we praise our Lord and Father, and with it we curse human beings, who have been made in God's likeness. Out of the same mouth come praise and cursing, my brothers and sisters, this should not be. Can both fresh water and salt water flow from the same spring? My brothers and sisters, can a fig tree bear olives, or can a grapevine bear figs? Neither can a salt spring produce fresh water. Who is wise and understanding among you? Let them show it by their good life, by deeds done in the humility that comes from wisdom. But if you harbour bitter envy and selfish ambition in your hearts... Do not boast about it or deny the truth. Such wisdom does not come down from heaven, but is earthly, unspiritual, demonic. 
For where you have envy and selfish ambition, there you will find disorder and every evil practice. But the wisdom that comes from heaven is first of all pure, then peace-loving, considerate, submissive, full of mercy and good fruit, impartial and sincere. Peacemakers who sow in peace reap a harvest of righteousness. Thanks. Yep, cool. Thanks. Um, yeah, thanks for having us here today. Um, it was great meeting quite a few of you at the English camp a few months ago. And uh, thank you for your continual prayers and support as we continue to serve from the Australian home side as well uh, to serve mission. Keep your Bibles open because we'll be looking um, through this passage in James chapter 3. And I'll just start off with a story from when I was a kid. When I was, about young, when I was young, uh, about 14 years old, I was walking down the main road in Hurstville. I grew up in Hurstville, in Bexley, Hurstville, Rockdale, that area. And I was walking home from school on this road. A few young guys drove by. And then one guy hung out of the car, screamed out, Ching Chong Chinaman, go home. And I was shocked. And I can still remember the place that that happened. Do you have it on the slide? No? No? <laughs> I went to Google's to find the spot. No? It's not there? Okay. Well, anyway, I found Google's, you know, the Google, whatever, the man that goes there and show a picture of where it is. There it is. Next to that sign, that overpass. That's exactly where it happened. And so whenever we drive by on, along this road, Forest Road, down in Bexley, just, just this little hint says, that's where it happened. It's burnt into my memory. I'm sure you have things spoken to you that is burnt into your memory. Maybe they're positive things. Maybe they're very negative things. There's an old saying, kids saying, isn't there? Sticks and stones may break my bones, but... Oh, you don't know it. Oh, thank you, thank you. I was thinking, maybe they don't know it now. <laughs> yes, words will never hurt me. That is an old-fashioned saying. That's in the time when they didn't understand emotional issues, things like that. But now we know words hurt. They really hurt. They're powerful. They're dangerous. Words scar other people's hearts and our hearts. And so we're going to look at that today, James chapter 3. And we're looking at, going to look at three key points. Firstly, the tongue is small and powerful. Secondly, the tongue is destructive. Thirdly, heavenly wisdom and earthly wisdom. It's interesting, isn't it? When was the last time you worked in, worked in godliness in your tongue? I don't think I've ever had, had someone come to me and say, Mike, I'm wrestling with criticism towards my boss. Never had that. Or I've never had someone that said, I'm, I'm struggling to be respectful to my parents. Or I'm struggling to speak to my spouse without contempt or criticism. When was the last time you worked on your tongue, on your words, isn't it true? It, it seems like if I went out there and killed someone, robbed the bank, committed adultery, hit someone, that's terrible. And yet I say something, one sentence that destroys someone's heart, and I'm unrepentant, and I don't care. Why? There's something about the tongue that we don't think is that bad, and that we don't care. But today, James will bring us back and remind us, God cares about your words. He cares about our actions and our words. Do you care? When's the last time you repented? Keep your Bibles open and let's ask God to help us with our tongue. Will you join with me and ask God to help us? Let's pray. Our Heavenly Father, Thank you today, we can stop and think about words and our tongue. Father, we confess that there are times when we use our tongue, knowingly, unknowingly, 
to hurt others in ways that displease you. We know that. Father, speak to us today through this passage, your word. Give us wisdom. Transform our tongue and our words. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So just to start with the context of the passage, since it's coming out of nowhere, the letter was written by the Apostle James, the half-brother of Jesus, written to Christians who he describes as double-minded. Let's look at the passage, chapter 1. Oh, yeah, back in chapter 1, James chapter 1, verse 5 to 8. Verse 5 says, If any of you lacks wisdom, he should ask God, who gives generously to all without finding fault, and it will be given to you. But when he asked, he must believe and not doubt, because he who doubts is like a wave of the sea, blown and tossed by the wind. That man should not think he will receive anything from the Lord. He is double-minded, a double-minded man, unstable in all he does. See that in verse 8? Double-minded. That's the problem James is dealing with. Double-minded describes a person, two minds, two hearts, divided, indecisive, have two loyalties. This person's unstable, verse 8. Verse 6, he's like a wave in the sea, blown and tossed by the wind. Double-mindedness. My grandfather had three or four wives. You see, back in those days in China, you could have multiple wives, and I say four, it was a long time, I didn't know, why is there all four? I had never worked it out, but apparently because of the war, for many years, he didn't go back to China. He lived in Australia, and he had a fourth partner, and that was the partner that lived, and they go overseas, and I think she got left out of the wheel, but anyway, that's, that's another story. So can you imagine on my wedding day... I'm said my vows, I, Mike, take you, Joyce, to be my wife. And at the end of my vows, I said to her, and by the way, I'm open to having another wife. But you'll be the main one. You're the main one, okay? But you'll take care of the money and the house, but I'm open to having another wife. Is that okay? No, that's not okay. Can you imagine on that day if I said that? You wouldn't agree, would you, Joyce? We're expected to be undivided, single-minded devotion in marriage, don't we? But so does God. God expects undivided devotion only to him and no one else. But the problem with these Christians are, they say Jesus is my Lord and I trust in you, but, but they don't. They're double-minded, unstable. And as they live for the world, James says, it's shown in their actions. It's shown in their words. It's shown in their lives. And we focus on chapter 3 where he focuses only on the tongue. And before we start and get into our three points is we need to ask ourselves, am I a double-minded Christian? Do I believe in Jesus with my whole heart? And yet there's areas in my life I'm not prepared to give up or change. My career, I'm not going to change that. My mortgage, no way. My children's education, I have very high expectations. My running, I, I quite like running lately. I told you at the weekend, I really like running. These are all good things, but there's possibility good things can take us away from God and that we could be double-minded, isn't it? And so with this context of double-mindedness, let's look at the first point that we'll look at. Firstly, the tongue is small but powerful. Look at James chapter 3, verse 1 to 5. Not many of you should presume to be teachers, my brothers, because you know that we who teach will be judged more strictly. We all stumble in many ways. Anyone who is never at fault in what he, they say is perfect, able to keep their whole body in check. When we put bits into the mouths of horses to make them obey us, we can turn the whole animal or take ships as an example. Although they are so large and are driven by strong winds, they are steered by a very small rudder wherever the pilot wants to go. Likewise, the tongue is a small part of the body, but it makes great boast. 
Consider what a great forest is, a, is set on fire by a small star, spark. So in these verses, there's three illustrations and one challenge to show that the tongue is small but powerful. First illustration, verse 3, is bits in the mouths of the tongue. I didn't know what a bit looked like, and so I looked it up. It's a small thing, this metal thing, that goes into the mouth of a horse. And it's really small. And yet this small thing, you can, the rider can control a big, powerful horse. It's small, but powerful. The second illustration are rudders on ships in verse 4. Likewise, the rudder of a boat, it's really quite small but it can control where a whole boat goes, a boat that can sit many people. It's only a small thing. And the third illustration is a spark. We saw that in um, John's kids' talk. A spark's really small. You know, if you have a little flint and you just see this little orange light just float by, and yet that little spark can cause a huge fire. We, we know that in Australia. Fires are, are destructive it can go on for days and weeks. It can take burn houses and things like that. This tongue in our mouth is small, but it is powerful. When I was in China, I joined the local gym, and uh, I used to think Chinese men were small like me, you know, and, and weak and a bit puny until I went to China. You know, you have tall guys in northern China, not like southern Chinese people. I'm small and weak. Northern Chinese people, they're big, okay? Who's from northern China, actually? Oh, we're all southerners. We're all small and weak. Well, when you go to the north, they're tall. You go to the gym, they're huge. You know, I've never seen Chinese men so big in my life. You know, no necks, big legs. And here I am, a, a southerner in the corner, just trying to look out of place, not out of place, not notice. See, these big, beefy guys, they're working on their biceps and their thighs. Strong muscles. But they don't realize the best muscle they have is their tongue. With our tongue, the power to make someone happy, wow. With our tongue, the power to destroy someone, to start wars, that is powerful. And so James gives a challenge to teachers, verse 1 to 2. Not many of you should presume to be teachers, my brothers, because you know that we who teach will be judged more strictly. We all stumble in many ways. Anyone who's never at fault in what they say is perfect, able to keep their whole body in check. I used to think verse 1, it's just out of place. He's talking about these teachers. It just, but the more I looked at it, the more I realized, yes, teachers relates to the tongue, small and powerful, we use this tongue to share the gospel with someone. They could have eternal life. Wow. Eternal life. That's amazing. We can use our tongue as we teach the Bible, as we lead Sunday school kids, and it transforms their marriages. It changes them. It gives them hope. That is powerful. Teachers. Here it says uh, in verse 1, we'll be judged more strictly. And I don't think it's a teacher will be great, more greatly punished, like John's going to be beaten more or something like that. Or he has a higher bar and he, he's not going to get in, but we'll get in because he's more judged more harshly. No, I don't think it's that. I think the responsibility, you've got this role to teach. Now you're expected to be faithful in that role. I used to go to a church, and David Cook, who was a principal of a Bible college back then, he regularly came to preach at our church, and, and a few, uh, someone organized for us to have like preaching practice. So about seven guys went into a room, and we took turns preaching, and we gave feedback. And one day, one guy, he just said, oh, 
I hadn't, sorry, I didn't really prepare and he got up and he did his sermon and sat down and, and I thought, wow, that was pretty good for really badly prepared. Not bad. Then David Cook got up. He was so serious and he rebuked the guy sternly. He said, this is not how you handle the word of God. This is a responsibility you don't take lightly, teaching the word of God. Next time, come prepared. John, were you there? <laughs> wasn't you? It wasn't him, okay? <laughs> I didn't get that to them. Yeah, I'm not saying. We were shocked. You know, usually when you give feedback, it's like, oh, you did this really well. You did this really well. We want to be encouraging and gentle to but boy, this guy was prepared next time we came, he came and preached there. We all realized this is serious. We're handling the word of God that changes people. Are you a Bible study leader, Sunday school teacher, a switch leader? You read the Bible one to one, and maybe you preach at churches. Do you take your role as a teacher seriously? Do you realize the power that comes with that? Are you tempted to be lazy? Do minimal uh, preparation. Just wing it. She'll be right. I'm too busy. This passage is a challenge to teachers. As you teach, your tongue is powerful with God's word working. It can save. It can grow. It is a big responsibility. And so this is the first point. The tongue is small but powerful. So the second point, the tongue is dangerous from 6 to 12. The tongue also is a fire, a world of evil among the parts of the body. It corrupts the whole body, sets the whole course of life, one's life on fire, and in itself set on fire by hell. All kinds of animals, birds, reptiles, and sea creatures are being tamed and have been tamed by mankind, but no human being can tame the tongue. It is a restless evil full of deadly poison. See the words describing how dangerous the tongue is. Look at verse 5. A tongue is a fire. It's destructive. It spreads. It destroys. You know, with a few words, a friendship that would last 10 years is suddenly destroyed. Seven and eight, all animals can be tamed, but the tongue no, longer, no one can tame. The word tame here doesn't mean domesticate like all animals can be like our cat and dog. It's more to subdue and control. We can control a whale. We can control elephants in zoos. But the tongue is out of control. Can you see this picture? This tongue is just this dangerous, out of control thing, destroying and the tongue itself, I don't think it's intrinsically bad or unholy. It's the tongue, it's the heart, it's the words that come out, isn't it? Jesus says something similar in Matthew 12, 34. For out of the overflow of the heart, the mouth speaks. The key issue in the end is not your tongue, it's the heart. What your heart is like will impact what you will say and how you say things. So when you get angry at someone, it's from the heart. When you criticize, when you boast, it's from the heart. It's, and yet here, it is dangerous. In October this year, it's reported by Human Rights Group, Hamas attacked targeting civilians, taking civilians hostages, using them as human shields, United Nations Human Rights reported that babies had their head cut off, bodies were bur then their bodies left burnt. And the world's newspapers and even their allies said, this is evil, unacceptable behavior. We think evil is out there. But James wants us to realize evil is actually very close at hand. It's in your mouth, to your tongue. Your, that's what destroys not out there. So I'd like to raise three specific areas. We might see the dung, tongue, sorry, tongue as dangerous and evil. Three areas. Firstly, fighting and quarrels at church. Chapter 4, verse 1 refers to that. 
the tongue destroys churches. I caught up with a friend who's starting a new position as a church minister the other day, and I asked him, what's the greatest challenge you have starting at a new church? He said, conflict between people within the church. Very difficult, taking lots of time and energy, working through conflict. And he's planning to run some piecewise training to support reconciliation and coming together. The second area that you might see the tongue as dangerous is how we speak to our parents. How we speak to our parents matters to God. I don't know about you, but it's very easy to come to church, be friendly, welcoming, to look godly, get involved at church. Then we go home, close the door, our guard comes down, and we speak so rudely to our parents sometimes, don't we? Disrespectful, talking back. Thirdly, the third area that we might see a dangerous tongue is in marriage. Marriage is hard work. You put two sinful people together, there's going to be arguments. Then you add a few little kids in there, it's even more challenging. The most challenging time in our marriage was when Olive was six months to two and a half years. They were hard times. Lots of arguments. And if there are times in your marriage, if there are challenges, my encouragement is don't let it go. Often I see couples and we're going to work through it together, but after a few years, it just becomes the nature of their relationship. They're used to the way of relating to that rather than actually dealing with the issues in their marriage. So my encouragement would be to talk about it with other people. So this is the second point. The tongue is dangerous, isn't it? Mm. So how are we going to fix that? What's the solution to this dangerous and powerful tongue? And we see that in our third point, heavenly wisdom and earthly wisdom. And we're going to look at James chapter 3, verse 13 to 18. And I've sort of colored it in different sections. So verse 13, the first verse, and the last two verses, 17 and 18, that describes heavenly wisdom. And then the second, the middle section, verse 14 to 16, describes earthly wisdom. So just take note. So verse 13. Who is wise and understanding among you? Let him show it by his good life, by deeds done in the humility that comes from wisdom. But if you harbor bitter envy and selfish ambition in your hearts, do not boast about it, or deny the truth. Such wisdom does not come down from heaven, but is earthly, unspiritual, of the devil. For where you have envy and selfish ambition, there you will find disorder and every evil practice. But the wisdom that comes from heaven is first of all pure, then peace-loving, considerate, submissive, full of mercy, good fruit, impartial and sincere. Peacemakers who sow in peace raise a harvest of righteousness. So in these verses, 13 and 18, James is saying there are two types of wisdom, a wisdom from heaven and a wisdom from earth. So let's look at both. Wisdom from heaven is from God, and it's characterized, verse 13, in humility. Humility is not like Asian false humility. You know, when someone comes up to me and says, Mike, you're such a good father to your kids. And I say, no, 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 I'm not a good father. No, no, no. But in my heart, I'm thinking, yeah, I try my best. Yeah, yeah, yeah. (laughs) That's false Asian humility. True humility is saying, putting someone else above me. I will serve you more than I'll serve myself. I will put your needs first. I will love you before I love myself. I come second. That is true humility. And verse 17 just describes some characteristics. It's pure, considerate, compassion, merciful, peaceful. Can you see that? Heavenly wisdom is, produces relational per- characteristics. It will strengthen marriages. It will strengthen the church. And that's what we want, don't we? We want better relationships. 
We want deeper friendships. We want to pay close to our parents and our children. We want close marriages. We want deep fellowship within the church. God can help us. It's through God's wisdom, given from God, God's wisdom shapes our tongue. That's great, isn't it? That's the solution to our problem, from God. But there's a contrast here to earthly wisdom. Verse 15, this earthly wisdom is of the devil and unspiritual. The character of earthly wisdom is selfish ambition. Me, bitter envy, looking around and just focusing on me, verse 14. And look at the results in verse 16. The results of earthly wisdom is disorder and evil practices. Earthly wisdom, because it focuses on self, destroys relationships. It's what creates wars. It's what creates divisions in the church. It destroys marriages. Sometimes we think earthly wisdom is just neutral. It doesn't hurt us. You know, earthly wisdom about work and career, you know, it's just a wise way of doing things. Study. Oh, I just use earthly wisdom. Oh, it's just the way. It's neutral. It, James saying earthly wisdom is not neutral. It's of the devil. Oh, earthly wisdom is of the devil, he says. It's self-seeking and selfish. It destroys the relationships. It's dangerous. It creates wars, conflict, destroys marriages and families. Beware of worldly wisdom. Don't trust it. Don't follow it. It is dangerous. We need to add, remember that context. The problem with these people is they're double-minded. Remember chapter, verse, chapter 1, verse 8? They say they follow Jesus and trust in Jesus, but they're double-minded. They're actually living for the world. They love living for self. They love living for their career, for their house, the mortgage, and for others. That's dangerous, being double-minded. Can you see what James is saying? You can't do both. You follow the earthly wisdom, that will destroy. We need God's wisdom, heavenly wisdom. It's not a trying to do both. James is saying it's this or that. I once heard a story of a friend's son. He was out with friends. And um, one of his friends gave him a bite of a bread top red bean bun. Well, I've got a picture of it, but it hasn't appeared. That's okay. Yeah. But he didn't realize there was peanuts in it. And he was allergic to peanuts. So he had an anaphylactic reaction. And it was bad enough that his friend had to administer the EpiPen in the thigh. Thank goodness he had the EpiPen nearby. But it didn't really work, the, work well, and the boy had to, be, had to call an ambulance. In the ambulance, he went unconscious and had to be revived at hospital. In his 15, 16 years of life, he had never been used an EpiPen. He had never had to go to a hospital. It's a parent's worst nightmare. Olive has an EpiPen for nuts. So we're aware of the danger of having nuts and making sure we have an EpiPen. But it's very easy for us to become relaxed. She's, she's never used an EpiPen. She's never had a bit anaphylactic, anaphylactic reaction. It'll be right. No worries. But this story reminded us, oh, be careful. It's dangerous. Take that danger seriously. You see, that's what James is saying. Double-mindedness is dangerous. It's not a small matter. The world says, it's okay, career, mortgage, kids' education, go for it. It's okay to be selfish and live for yourself. You deserve it. You work hard. Everyone does it. <laughs> why, why should I do anything else otherwise? And James is saying, no, 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 no. Double mindedness, living for the world, worldly wisdom, it does not work. Stop it. It's destructive to you and to your relationships. Any relationship that you care about, it could destroy it. Be careful. What areas 
are you tempted to be double-minded in? Hmm? What areas that you just want to hold on? The career, the house and mortgage, my kids' education, my selfish ambition, my self-glory. I just want it. We want it, don't we? It's so ingrained in us as an Asian. These things are the core value of who we are. can't even imagine letting go or releasing my hand of anything. I still remember the day when I was... Um, the first time I was asked to lead a Bible study for a year. I thought, you mean... That's going to take time. I wanted to put that time to my studies as an architect. That means sacrifice. Am I prepared for that? Uh, it, I really wrestled with that. You know, can you imagine I'm clinched on it? This is the way I've always done things. And I'm so glad after prayer, I actually took it on board. But even though I took on the role... It was a real hard thing to let go of that expectation of all my studies. Work hard. And I'm so glad I did it. I am so glad. James wants us. He's challenged here. We have to open our hands, hold these things loosely, be prepared to let them go. And he wants us to hold on Jesus, come back to Jesus, be single-minded, wholeheartedly, completely faithful to him alone. God, through that, God will give us the wisdom needed to shape our lives, to shape our words, to build genuine, peace-filled, loving relationships. That's what we want, don't we? Today, we looked at three points. The tongue is small and powerful. The tongue is dangerous. Heavenly wisdom, earthly wisdom. Wisdom. Will you join me in praying about those things? Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we know our tongue is powerful. We know our tongue is dangerous. Heavenly Father, please give us your wisdom to use our tongue, to use our lives to please you and you alone. Father, please forgive us when we are double-minded. Please forgive us when we love the world more than we love you. Please forgive us when we live for selfishness, ambition, envy, rather than putting the needs of others before ourselves. Most importantly, help us to be single-minded, living wholeheartedly to you and you alone. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thanks, Mike, for that very challenging talk about not only the tongue, but our hearts behind the words that we speak um, and for the reminder that earthly wisdom is not neutral, um, but that it makes us double-minded. So um, as we sing this song, we need God's wisdom and his spirit to help us to let go of our desires and to offer our lives for God to use for his pleasure and glory. So please stand and let's sing Take My Life. And the offer tree bags will be passed around during this song as well.
We now come to a time of the Holy Communion. We have heard of the heavenly wisdom that is above earthly wisdom. And we see that the heavenly wisdom sent his son to be our rescue, our salvation, our transformation, so that we might be right with him. God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. At the heart of the Christian life is active trust in the Lord Jesus Christ and his sacrificial death for sin. In this symbolic meal, originating from Jesus' last supper with his disciples, we express and strengthen our trust in him as we eat and drink with our brothers and sisters in Christ. Holy Communion is an outward and visible sign of the grace shown to us in Christ. As we share bread and juice together, we are invited to feed on him in our hearts by faith with thanksgiving. We are faced again with God's love for the unworthy, and that's us, and are strengthened by faith in the one whose body was given and whose blood was shed for us. Well, today, come now with heartfelt repentance and genuine trust in the Lord Jesus, recognising the significance of sharing in this way. If in good conscience it would not be right for you to participate, please use this time to reflect on God's love for us in Christ. Well, knowing the goodness of God and the times we have failed to respond with love and obedience, let us confess our sins together. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, you have loved us with an everlasting love, but we have often gone our own way and rejected your will for our lives. We're sorry for our sins and turn away from them. For the sake of your Son who died for us, forgive us, cleanse us and change us. By your Holy Spirit, enable us to live for you and to please you in every way for the glory of our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. The scriptures promise us that God is slow to anger and full of compassion. He forgives all of us who humbly repent and turn to his son, Jesus Christ, in whom there is no condemnation. We praise and thank our heavenly father for every spiritual blessing in Jesus, our Lord, in whom we have the forgiveness of sins, the gift of his spirit and the hope of sharing in his glory. We who are once far away have been brought near by the blood of his son, he loved us and gave himself for us as a fragrant offering and sacrifice to God. Therefore, we lift our voices to praise him, saying, Glory be to God in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations, forever and ever. Amen. We think of the very first time that Jesus met, uh, that set a pattern for us. On the night before he died, Jesus took bread, and after he had given thanks, he broke it, and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take and eat, this is my body which is broken for you, do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, after the meal, Jesus took the cup, and after he had given thanks, he gave it to his disciples, saying, Drink from this, all of you, this is my blood of the new covenant, which is shed for you and for many, for the forgiveness of sins, do this as often as you drink it, in remembrance of me. Now is the time for those who are at home, if you would uh, gather your bread or juice or wine, and uh, now here at church we will uh, distribute, and if you please hold the uh, bread as well as the juice, and we will eat and drink all together. If you are a Christian, if you trust in the Lord Jesus, then you're welcome to uh, share in our meal, and uh, so we will be back all together in a few minutes.
Now is the time for us to uh, eat and drink together. Let us take and eat this, remembering that Christ's body was broken for us and feed on him in our hearts by faith with thanksgiving. Let us drink this, remembering that Christ's blood was shed for us, and be thankful. Our response to being fed by God is one of thanksgiving and dedication. Let us pray. Father of all, we give you thanks and praise that when we were still far off, you met us in your Son and brought us home. Dying and living, he declared your love, gave us grace and opened the gate of glory. May we who share Christ's body live his risen life, we who drink his cup bring life to others, we whom the Spirit lights give light to the world. Keep us in this hope that we have grasped, so we and all your children shall be free and the whole earth live to praise your name. We end our segment with words of blessing to him who is able to keep us from falling and to present us before his glorious presence without fault and with great joy. To the only God, our Saviour, be glory, majesty, power and authority through Jesus Christ our Lord before all ages now and forevermore. Amen. All right, we've come to the end of service. Um, yeah, we've heard um, and been challenged about to think about how uh, in our life are we um, double-minded? How do we sometimes struggle with um, our tongue and the words that we say? Um, I think that um, is a really big challenge for all of us to um, continue to think about um, and yeah, to also confess to one another um, our sins so that we can be um, accountable uh, to each other as well. Um, we have also the blessing of having church lunch. Um, so yeah, please join us in the side hall um, to, for lunch. And if you are new here, it is also on the house, which is a great incentive to stay. Um, but how about I yeah, close the service off in prayer and also um, saying grace for the meal that we're about to eat. Uh, Heavenly Father, Lord, thank you for um, your wisdom. Thank you that it is um, in your grace um, and your generosity to us that we can share in um, heavenly wisdom. Uh, Lord, we pray that as we um, think about our lives and reflect on um, how we can be double-minded and how we can um, yeah, be hypocritical in um, yeah, some areas of our lives. We pray that you would help us to turn away uh, from these idols, turn away from the temptations to make them bigger than you in our lives. Lord, we pray also that you might illuminate the areas in our lives that we might not be able to see um, where we... Uh, yeah, might be putting good things um, above you. And we pray that you would help us to do that and um, provide for us um, each other to be able to encourage one another and challenge each other um, in our uh, walk with you. And we also thank you for the hands that have made church lunch for us this afternoon. We thank you for their, um, yeah, their service to us and we pray that you would be blessing the food to our bodies and also blessing the conversations that we'll be having um, over lunch. And we pray all this in your son's name. Amen. Awesome. Um, thanks for coming today and um, yeah, we'll see you next week. <laughs>